Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. A little bit of a different view for you today. So I'm the one who's looking straight into the sun porch and you guys get to see what I normally see, which is like, I don't know, the south side of our house. It's yeah. not super interesting. There is a crab apple in bloom back there though. I think you can see the pink blooms, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can it's see pretty. It. It's pretty back there. Um, so we are doing a deep clean up here. Uh, so we moved all of the citrus and lemon cypress out of the front sun porch in a video actually this last week. And I did not realize how much of an echo there were, is in that room without yeah. the plants. It's a lot. Well, and you can hear a little bit of an echo even when the stuff is in there. You can? Yeah, um, more so when you're wearing headphones, but okay. you can hear it. I never realized that, but I, I can real I realize it now. Like it's crazy echoey and I, hopefully th this is okay. It sounds not as bad, but you can probably see like one of the reasons why we need to clean up here is we're getting ready for the house to be painted and uh, they're going to scrape and paint a lot of this front area. So you can kind of see like where there's water damage right here. In fact, it's been raining this morning. It's been such a beautiful morning, no wind and a good saturating rain. It is so rare here that Aaron, I almost just said for the day, like, cancel it. <laughs> like, I just wanted to sit here and I just want to look outside, not necessarily be in it, but I want to be watching it. I want to be watching my plants soak it in. Anyway, but here we are, not canceling it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's just jump into videos from this last week. The first one was planting sweet peas and fertilizing the lawn. I planted like 350 plus sweet peas out there. Um, and then it proceeded to be one of the most windy weekends of my life, I swear. <laughs> when you're looking out at these tender little seedlings, I had hardened them off, but not for the type of wind we were getting. Anyway, any wind feels really horrible when you've got little seedlings out there. Uh, and then fertilizing the lawn was something Aaron was working on. So we just kind of went over real briefly what we were using this time of year. Top comment from Marcy. Laura, if you didn't see our video where we installed the fences, me thinking, we all watch all your videos, Laura. You are part of our routine, <laughs> which is so awesome. I love that. But uh, sometimes I think about people who are just like finding the channel and because it happens all the time, you know, we're getting new people um, joining our little community here. And I think, you know, sometimes I need to have more of a backstory on what I'm doing because a lot of times I just launch into something that you guys would know, the, those of you who have been watching our videos for a long time. Anyway, so I always want to like assume that not everybody's been <laughs> watching for a really long time. Christine said, does Erin know how the Espoma Lawn food compares to Milorganite, another organic fertilizer? I've been curious to try the Espoma Lawn products since I love their garden fertilizers. Curious how you both think the Espoma Lawn line compares to other lawn care products you've used. Well, for me, and I don't know, you can speak to your experience, but my experience really is limited in this area. I don't think my parents have ever down at the garden center brought in Milorganite. And you tend to kind of stick with the things, well, one, I had my parents as an example and they've been using espoma products forever like i remember the smell from when i was young when i was a little girl and it's distinct it's very distinctive and now it's a kind of a nostalgic smell I'm like hmm oh the smell yeah. the smell of my childhood out in the lawn when my dad would fertilize the lawn um and so you kind of just tend to stick with things that work for you in the or have worked for you throughout the years and in the past um like i've found no reason to really venture out yeah when, oh. when something works you just do it. I mean, how many years have we been using the Espoma Well, I've been food? using it since, I mean, I helped my parents apply it. Yeah. So I've been using it for a long time. You've been using it long, as long as we've had a garden. Yeah. So we've been married for, what, 15 years almost? Dang. D yeah, dang. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kristen said, Laura, any ideas what's going on with land and sea compost? I noticed you have a bunch of bags. I can't even get my hands on two. All of my suppliers, I'm about ready to put some cameras, video cameras out on my land and sea. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of my suppliers are saying they can't get it from Espoma. I know they're having a tough time, like keeping up, like even getting, like keeping up the production of it because it's just like, it's been a really winner of a new introduction to their line and yeah. it's worked wonders for us. And that's why I speak so highly of it. Um, but yeah, they've been ha having a hard time just keeping up with production, like even sourcing the ingredients well, and to I'm, make it. I think you have to keep in mind too that like um, compost is not the main thing that Espoma does. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they can't, you know, they can't dedicate their entire line to just making the compost, mm -hmm. which I believe is, is popular. Um, but they have a bunch of other stuff they got to get through as well. And, and I think 
they're probably dealing with issues just like every other business is with yeah. staffing, labor, and, and keeping keeping the plant you know supplies. running as much as as they can. Yeah, it's so hard to find workers right now. Mm -hmm. And you know sometimes too, it's hard depending on what state you live in. Some states you know you can't get it um, due to labeling issues and stuff like that. So um, that could be something or a reason why too. Therese said, it may be a silly question, but are these just for the, for the pretty flowers or will they also produce peas? Well, they do produce peas. I don't think they're edible. I think they're toxic, right? They produce pe peas that are the, then the seeds for your next year's crop. I gathered a bunch of them myself. In fact, I had the best germ from my own seeds. Oh, really? Yeah, that I collected last year. Um, anyway, I, yeah, I don't think you eat them. I've never, well, hold on. <laughs> like, I feel like I should know that. That's a piece of information. Our well, it's not a dumb question then. How about our that? Are sweet pea seeds toxic to humans? Oh, they're mildly poisonous. So <laughs> probably, probably don't eat them. Oh, if ingested in large quantities, it can cause paralysis, labored breathing, and convulsions. Carrie said, sorry the video went so fast at adding plants to the soil part. Did you just plant into the compost or did you stir the compost into the soil to mix better? I saw no trowel, so assume you just spread the compost and planted into it. I tried to plant my roots into amended soil and if you didn't mix the native soil in, I would have loved to see that. Either way, got mine in yesterday and glad to see I was in your good company. Happy spring to all. So um, what I did is I just like mildly mixed it up with my fingers um, when I was in there planting. Uh, it did look like I had a tremendous amount of compost still on top of the soil, which I still did. I put a lot in that space and I plan on doing that every time I plant something I really want to start heavily amending that area because now that we know like this is the permanent space this is where we're gonna be planting our stuff every year I feel like I really want to um, like invest in the quality of so I want to invest in the quality of soil in our entire property of course but this is on a smaller scale and it's like easier to start small but not in the driveways well, of course not. I want that to be like barren land, yeah. <laughs> barren land um, where no weeds will even venture to grow. Uh, anyway, so I kind of mix it in a little bit and it's so fluffy because Aaron tilled it that I've got fluffy soil, fluffy compost. I could kind of like mix it a bit and spread it, you know, and pop my plants right in. So yeah. HSL said, how many bags of biotone and compost would you say you go through in a year? Quite a number of them. Like I'm not sure exactly. 20 to 30 maybe? Uh, of biotone? biotone? Yeah, probably minimum, minimum 20. And then last year, I want to say that we had two pallets of land and sea. Uh -huh. So however many bags come on I don't on even two know pallets. how many bags. It's not like a tall, tall pallet like no, some potting not. soils. It's like almost like it, a half size yeah, it feels pallet. Like a half. And I don't know how many bags are on that. It wasn't, an, it wasn't enough last year. Remember I ran out, like I didn't amend any of the area where I planted any of the sunflowers yeah. or like the corn um, because it just, I ran out. Uh, anyway, but your parents go through two pallets of yeah. When you have a large compost. a larger space, it's just really easy to go through compost and fertilizer when you are um, planting things all the time. I mean, it's our business, so it kind of makes sense. Yeah. But anyway, we go through quite a number of them. Uh, Angela said, "As far as your lawn, do you spray for weeds? Since you do so much organic gardening, fertilizing, I'm curious if that's something you do as well. If so, do you have an organic spray you use or recommend? In fact, I went over that later on in another video that went up. Was that today? Yeah." Was it? Uh -huh. The one that went up this morning. This yeah. morning? So Bonnet Today has Today is a... Monday, by the way. Oh, yes. Today is Monday. Yeah. Yes. So Bonnet has a couple of new natural spray products out. It's a part of the Captain Jack's line, which you might be familiar with their insecticides, the Captain Jack's dead bug. We've used that quite a bit, uh, but they have a dead weed brew now and a lawn weed brew. So one of them is a broadleaf specific, which is an uh, iron based product. And then there's a um, one that's broadleaf and grassy weeds. So that's the dead weed brew. And that's caprylic acid and capric acid are the active ingredients in that one. And so we're just trying those out this year. And so far, like Aaron went and checked on those dandelions that he sprayed in the video and they're gone they're yeah. dead and just a few hours after I sprayed the dead weed brew on the weeds in our driveway they were dead now I'm not really sure like that seems a little quick and so I wonder part of me wonders am I just burning the tops on these things which if that is the case and I'm not sure it is but if that is the case it's still okay because if it comes back from the roots and you hit it again, like you're not letting this weed take in enough energy and eventually you kill it. Mm -hmm. And so even if, even if it's not 100% effective and it takes you more than one spray application, I still think it's better than using the harsher synthetic chemicals, which there are, I mean, there's a very rare occasion where we will break out for like goat weeds and bindweed because nothing knocks it down. But yeah. we're gonna be trying out these um, 
new products on that as well. I actually have like a little test area where I know there's a ton of bindweed coming up in one of the pathways in our cut flower garden. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna like rope it off. <laughs> Be like, nobody touch this, I'm doing a test with a dead weed brew on yeah. that. So we'll let you know. Gardening from scratch says, have you ever used Espoma green sand? I was wondering if that would be something you'd use for your new property to build the soil with, or are you just going to layer the ground with compost over the years? We'll probably do compost for the most part. I'm guessing compost and soil acidifier. Um, green sand though, I know is a good source of iron, which we, we do deal with a lack of iron in the soil. That's how we deal with chlorosis. I don't know that we like deal in, with the lack of iron. I think it's just bound up uh, because of the alkalinity. And that's why we're using soil acidifier I think a lot the more. iron is there. I think it just can't, the plants so can't take it up. It may be. I mean, over the years, I'm sure our approach will evolve. I mean, it already has. I feel like we've evolved a little bit mm -hmm. and, and figuring out, like we haven't ever used soil acidifier as much as we're using it now. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we see some like major improvements yeah. from that. The more I've been talking to people though, it sounds like soil acidifier is a little bit more of a quick shot. Just like um, gypsum? Yeah, where you know, you're not gonna really see um, like super long lasting, but you know what, if we just keep it's at it. It's diligent. If we're diligent and we you know probably have to apply it into a lot of things that we know need more acidic soil, um, like maybe three times a year. Mm -hmm then we might start seeing some We could figure results. out how to acidify our water. That would be great. Well, you know what? I've talked to a few people about that. It is possible because um, they do it at growing operations, especially in this area. They have to acidify their water because it's too alkaline. At what, po uh, like at what point, how do you, where do you bridge the gap between your well and where it's coming out? Like where uh, do you put a yeah, system? So you do it right at the, at the beginning of the well. Really? Like the, right after the pump. <sighs> so it, it goes through kind of like a dosatron and yeah, adds acid into the That mix. seems like a huge deal. Like to put something at the amount that we irrigate well, here. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how much it would cost. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, next video is transplanting roses and planting a boxwood hedge. So I've transplanted five basketball roses from in front of the gazebo plus a ginger wine nine bark. That wasn't kind of part of the plan in the beginning, but when I was standing there, I decided to move it. And then we brought home some sprinter boxwoods to finish off a hedge on the west side. And I'm loving the way it looks, except I can see it right now. And Aaron, I still haven't taken the tags off those boxwoods. I need to do that. Top comment was from Kelly. Side note, I have no clue how she gardens with her hair always looking so pretty. Thank you. Um, yesterday I spent three hours outside. I came in looking like the Crypt Keeper. Oh, there are days where I will look like that. Um, when I film, I'm naturally going slower than when I don't film because oftentimes, especially when I'm vlogging, we've been doing tons of vlogs lately. I set up all the cameras by myself. And so I stop in between like digging holes and stuff and I'm changing the camera all over the place. And I think that gives me a chance to cool down a little bit. Um, days where I don't film, which seem like they're getting fewer and far further between, I will like not even care about what I'm doing. It just looks like I roll around in the dirt. <laughs> Like it just does. I do attribute the. I don't think so. I think you look the same every. Just dirty all the time. <laughs> no, <laughs> like surface I didn't mean level that. dirty. <laughs> I just mean that I don't. I don't notice the difference between days that you're filming or not filming. To me, it all looks the same. Oh. So. Excellent. I think that's good. I think you look good all the time. Oh, thanks. Um. I kind of attribute it, I mean, one, I am used to wearing my hair down for everything because that's just how I, I do it. I do it the same all the time uh, because I don't, like, I don't know how to do hair. I just, like, figured out one way and that's the way I'm going to do it forever. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a really dry climate. So even though I actually have naturally curly hair, um, it doesn't hardly ever... Like occasionally you'll see like some curl wanting to start back here or like right here, um, but it stays pretty much the same all the time. <laughs> Uh, Anthony said, what is Laura's view while filming the recap videos? Well, this is usually the view right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, WK said, why do you never use transplanter solution to reduce shock, like a vitamin B12, I'm guessing, like a root stimulator? Is there no difference than all of what you add? So I used to use root stimulator, like, religiously. Every single time I planted anything, it was root stimulator, and then I would use it every couple of weeks on new plant newly planted stuff. And, um, I have started since using Biotone Starter Fertilizer on everything, and that's not something, like, I didn't use that every single time I used to plant. It was the always the root stimulator. Yeah. Um, and so now we just use the starter fertilizer and I don't find any 
reason to use the root stimulator. I don't see any difference. So, and it's more work because you have to mix it up and then go do it every couple of weeks. So anyway, Donna said, how is your lawn so green already? Water. There you go. Uh, Mary said, could you, oh, also speaking of water. So we've been letting our lawn up here kind of die. <laughs> like we haven't watered anything up here just because we wanted it to be nice and dry when we were getting ready to take it all out and start over. And now with all this rain, it's all like soggy again and the grass is going to green up and it's going to look just as good as the rest of our lawn. <laughs> I think. Yep. Mary said, could you please tell us the size of brown drip tubing you are using? So typically we use a half inch brown poly drip tubing that has the emitter holes every 18 inches. Drip Corp, I think. Dig Corp. Dig Corp is the We'll put a link name. down below. Okay. Christine said, did I see you run water into the hole before transplanting your rose? Is that customary? I do that on transplants um, if like a lot of soil didn't stay on the root ball, which it didn't on those. I just like to make sure that the roots are fully saturated. So I kind of position my plant in the hole, put some water in there, like make sure everything's nice and moist. And then I backfill with soil saturated again and then typically like I'll leave a little soil if I've got extra next to the plant and I'll come back a little bit later once everything's kind of settled and I'll pack in any more dirt if they need any more uh, typically they don't but that way I just know that it got like as good of a welcome as possible to its new home uh Julie said what is your favorite boxwood and why I think I have two favorite boxwoods I really do like the Sprinter Boxwoods. We've used them a lot. They are an improved version of the win Winter Gems. Um, so they typically don't bronze out as much as the Winter Gems do in the winter time. They maintain their green. And I've had such good luck with like no winter kill. Um, the speed of their growth, they are speedier than Winter Gems. So I really do like those. But I also do like the um, green, green Mountains. Green Mountains are super common and you can find them all over the place. They grow with like naturally a more conical shape, which is I think what those big cone boxwoods that we dug up and moved are and they seem to maintain like the deepest green color they're not as glossy the leaves aren't as glossy as sprinters or winter gems and um and they're not as big they're not as broad so they're more of a slender leaf but they're deeper green a little bit more matte in color but they don't change color at all they like stay the same color all the time and i really appreciate that our sprinters did uh brown a little bit they bronzed a little bit this winter because i think of our spider mite issue last mm -hmm. year they were a little bit compromised, but I think they're okay. They're looking pretty good. Well, in the year before, our winter gems bronzed big time because we cut them back too late. Yeah. So I think part of it is like external conditions. Uh -huh. Like if you trim them too late in the season and they freeze, or if you have... Well, that was just like tip burn. I mean, like yeah. just winter kill. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't even like the plant changing color. But man, it looked like they were all going to die. <laughs> I mean, I literally thought we were going to have to replace a bunch of boxwoods. <sighs> Can you imagine? But they look great now. Next video is planting flowers that perform beautifully in both cool and warm temperatures. So I planted some coconut and lemon nemesia, nemesia. It's a really fun annual that does, uh, it's done really well for us. So typically I thought of this annual as being one that would um, peter out in the summer. So like when the heat really sets in, they kind of fizzle, but mine never did last year. I planted bluebird. Now I did plant them in an area that didn't get like full afternoon sun. And maybe that's why they were in an area that was consistently watered and they were like in dappled sun and they just did so well for me. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna plant a couple of different varieties in the landscape and we'll see, you know, how they do and in different locations as well so the yellow lemon uh, nemesia went by where we tried to put that arbor in by under our fireplace and the coconut went in our kind of entryway garden and we also showed you um, a sweet gift that cindy davison from the succulent perch sent uh benjamin she sent him that lawn tractor the john deere lawn tractor with the trailer which he adores um top comment from rachel anybody else living for the sound of laura planting and the bird cooing in the background did sound really peaceful yeah that was actually on my birthday that I did that and then right after that um Aaron and I dropped the kids off at my parents house and we went to Boise and just like we didn't even like we went and looked at pianos yeah. we went I went to one also, antique store sticker shock on the pianos yeah I had no idea how expensive they were yeah <laughs> I didn't even Aaron's like you want to play one we looked at Steinway's and I told him nope I don't even want to <laughs> I don't even want to know how awesome this piano is because yeah, price tag was. I what? thought it would be. I thought it would be the same price as like a really nice uh, new car. Uh huh. Nope. Like double it. It's like double the price <laughs> of two nice new cars. Yeah. Rebecca said you used compost last year instead of mulch. Why did you switch back to mulch again? 
It I'm trying to better. remember in front of the gazebo. Oh, we got a pickup load. Yeah, I just remember that it grayed out faster than it did. Than mulch and that was a does. lot of work. Oh, yeah, well, we didn't have the tractor at the time, so it was just yeah. shoveling, shoveling out of the back Shoveling it of, out of the back yeah. of the truck into the, the, whatever, the cart, and then taking it to the bed, dumping it, and then raking it out. Like, oh, so much more work than bags. Yeah. Bags is way easier. Uh, Diane said, can you give some tips on planting drifts? How many plants make a drift? How do you decide the shape of the drift? Mine always look like a two-year-old designed it. Um... It depends totally on your space. Like if you have a huge flower bed, I mean, it's going to take a lot more plants to make a nice impactful drift than it would in a smaller flower bed. And some flower beds, I can do a drift of five, you know, five annuals or five uh, perennials that don't get enormous. But like if I'm doing a big flower bed, I need to do a drift of like 17, you know, of this or that or whatever I'm using. Um, so I think it kind of kind of depends. And I typically like to shape my drifts to where um, it'll start maybe near the border and then it'll kind of drift back and like maybe tuck behind something. So you can start your next drift kind of in front of the end of the last drift so that it looks undulating more uh -huh. than like blocks. Because if you do a block, it's going to look like, you know, here's a drift of white annuals, drift of pink annuals, you know. Yeah. It'll look less... Um, flowy. Flowy. I was going to say less natural. <laughs> you can't even call it that. But uh, yeah, so I'll just do kind of like a lazy drift is what I call it. So it kind of usually starts like this and then gets bigger and then kind of goes back into a point. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like an eye shape, sort of? An eye. Oh, maybe. Ish. But it's like a wave and an eye. Oh, oh okay. Katie said, what happened to the gazillion caladiums you planted last year? Did you pull and store the bulbs or did you leave them and the bulbs decomposed? Um, we did dig them. We dried them down. We got them set to store and they never made it into the root cellar. So they're still sitting in the barn on that harvest rack. Ooh. Uh, I'm, I don't know. Have I you mean, checked on them? No. <laughs> Some things just fell through the cracks last year. It was a weird fall. I well, mean. Well, you were very pregnant. Yeah. I can... I mean, you had other things on your mind. <laughs> I did. There was a lot going on, and I was, like, physically a hurting unit last yeah. year, like, the whole thing. I actually knew that I was pregnant before I even knew, for sure, because my ribs started to hurt, like they did with Benjamin. But with Benjamin, it didn't happen until the last three months of being pregnant. But with Samantha Grace, I was in pain the entire time. It was kind of excruciating, and um, it went away, like, the second. I actually, though, purposed toward the end when it was so bad... I actually sat there and thought, I need to remember what this feels like so I can remember to be thankful mm. for my health, like, or my body, like my body not feeling like this once I'm done being pregnant. Yeah. It's, no, I think it's a good thing to remember that. I mean, it's a good, I don't know. I'm thankful. Especially when other people are yeah. struggling with their health. Like yeah. It how... gives you definitely some, what is that? Compassion yeah. and empathy. Yeah, for people that are dealing with like chronic pain and things like that. I just, I can't imagine because dealing with it for just nine months, I just thought, I I mean, that makes life really, really hard. Yeah. And that was even... not, had nothing to do with the Caladium question really, yeah. except for the fact that it did make me uh, forget about some things. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I should go check on them. It's possible. Maybe they made it. Because maybe if they're not in the ground getting moisture, like wet and freezing that way, maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, Don said, why didn't you break loose the roots before planting? They look root bound in the video. Oh, because that's a common myth, I think. Um, the more we have talked with growers in the industry and, um, yeah, gotten to know people that are growing things and uh, know kind of... Uh, I don't know, more about the plants than I do, they say it's really not necessary unless they're severely root bound. If you have a tree that's been in a container, nursery container for years, and it's like you can hardly see any soil left because there's so many roots, you don't want to break the root system in that case. But most of the time, um, it can cause more damage than it can good for your plant. So like with these annuals, unless it's a, a grass, an annual grass, I could see a little bit later in the season, they get root bound really quickly breaking the root system on something like that would be a good idea but for these no heather said i've i've got to get one of those augers for my drill does anyone have a link for that i do i will put it in the description not me aaron or ken will put it in the <laughs> description down below this video for you uh carrie said can someone please explain why it's necessary or if it is necessary to buy biotone fertilizer can you just use plant tone instead 
or in this case, Laura used flower tone. I love plant tone because it's used for so many different shrubs and perennials, even for boxes and arborvitas. So is it necessary to buy biotone fertilizer or just use the plant tone? Just use the plant tone. That's totally fine. The difference, the biotone is a little bit, it's formulated a little bit differently in that it, and we've done a whole video on it. We'll link that down below if you kind of want to know more of the breakdown of that type of fertilizer, but it is specifically blended to create strong roots really quickly. So it's a good starter fertilizer in that, but the plant tone is really good it as has, well. It has mycorrhizae yeah. in it, which, which is helpful for uh, roots starting. Right. So that's, that's why, you know, if you're going to get two, go ahead and get biotone and, and plant tone. But if you're just going to get one, just get plant tone. Yeah, plant, it's totally fine. Um, next video is planting three gorgeous clematis. So I got my hands on some of the sparky clematis from Proven Winners, which are brand new, I think this year. There's sparky pink, sparky purple, sparky blue. I planted one at the, on the fence on the end of the west side, one on kind of the pergola area by the brick patio, and one on our vegetable garden fence. And they are really pretty. I love them. Top comment was from Elsie Hugh. I appreciate the consistency of Garden Answers sound quality on the videos. I do not have to constantly adjust the volume during your videos, especially transitioning from commentary to music. That's nice Top to hear. Comment. Yeah, thank you for that. It's sometimes really um, difficult, like, you, you know, as I'm like touching my mic, <laughs> it's sometimes really difficult um, to make sure the audio is nice because mics are a total, total pain to wear when you're gardening. Like, I'm not going to lie. So my mic is attached to this giant cord and usually I have this attached to my back pocket. And then I have to like wad up the rest of the cord and stick it in my pocket. And if there is something to snag it on along the way. I will snag it on that and it'll like pull this out of my, ow, ow, Russell's playing with the cord in my lap. Ouch. It is not a piece of yarn. Anyway, if there's something to snag it on, I will. And oftentimes like it'll pull the mic out of my shirt or whatever. And I spend so much of my time like irritated at my mic, um, but it does help quite a bit. And occasionally we'll do a video where I don't realize my hair is like on it or I've got it placed wrong to where my coat's, you know, making rubbing on it or something. Yeah. And then it's, it's hard for us because we're like, oh, we don't even want to post videos like that that have bad audio. In fact, that's one of the things like you, uh, Aaron in particular recommends if you're just starting out doing videos and stuff that the first thing you should uh, invest in is a good audio equipment. Yeah. Use I mean, your cell phone for video mm -hmm. and get a mic. Yeah. Don't get a camera first. Right. Oh, and we'll link our, uh, maybe our gear page so you can see what our mics are. Yeah. Or at least the microphone. Yeah. Uh, Tina said, has anyone seen a link to the electric gator they have? It's just a, John Deere only sells one electric gator. So you could just Google John Deere electric gator. Um, there aren't any other options. I mean, there's other brands you could buy, but in and terms you, of John Deere. Are there other, like, different you options you can get You can't buy it online, that? though. So you, you'd have to go to a dealer. I think. I don't think you can order it online. Ours has, like, the brush guard in the front, right? That was an additional. Yeah, there's, like, except, but that's the whole point, is that you have to go to a dealer and then uh, price it out. And they'll ask you, you know, do you want a brush guard on the front? Do you mm -hmm. want the side guards? Did which your mom guards? did. We didn't. I didn't get them. Mm -hmm. um, they felt unnecessary. And then mm -hmm. there's a bunch of uh, attachments for the back. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My parents got one after we got one and tried ours out for a while. And my mom was like, oh, because they have a side by side, but it's loud. It's um, the tires tear everything up. Um, so she loves her gator. In fact, she was just telling us yesterday how much she loves being able to put all of her stuff in there and not drag a tarp around their whole garden all over the place. And it is nice. Amy said, will you have to restain the black fence yearly or just as needed? Just as needed. Like the vegetable garden fence was stained. Was that four years ago now that we had that fence installed? It's only been stained the one time. Yeah, it needs three, it. Three or four years? Three or four years. I just noticed this year that it needs it. Like it'll either get done this year or next year. So I'd say every like three to five years, you'd probably want to touch it up a bit. Probably depends too on where you live and how much moisture you get. Sure. We don't get a lot. So I think that but the we wear. we have a lot of sun that could uh, fade it. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I don't know. I don't know what kind of weather does what to the finishes <laughs> on wood, but it could be different for different climates. Imagine that said, you mentioned spring interest many times. How does one know the difference between flowers if they are summer interest or spring interest? And do you tailor the garden with each season in mind or just the current season? So you would just go, I would recommend to visit garden centers often often, at least once a season, if not once a month. Because if you can go down to a garden center once a month, you can see what's in bloom that time of year and what looks pretty. Because what looks pretty in April at a garden center may not look as pretty in August at a garden center. And so you can really start to learn what things are gonna be 
like giving back at what times of the year. And I am constantly like I do a lot seasonally just because I when we do videos and, and are working on video projects, I like the plants to look kind of in their prime so that you guys can see what what they look like. So let's say I'm looking out at a Brunnera right now. Like I would much rather plant a Brunnera in a video when it's in bloom and looking absolutely gorgeous just so that you guys can see the potential of this plant rather than plant it at a different time of year when it doesn't have bloom. That's a horrible example because I like that plant all year round. Um, but well, you know, like hydrangeas, you could plant or hibiscus. Maybe Ooh, that's a, that's good, a one. good one. Yeah. Yeah. You plant hibiscus early in the spring and it looks like nothing. It looks dead. Well, you know what? It's not that different from planting bulbs. I sh yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, you're planting with the hope <laughs> that yeah. it's going to look pretty in the spring. Um, hibiscus, you typically, like at the garden center here, if you don't buy them when they're dormant, like you will not get your hands on them because people snap them up so fast. So people are buying these sticks. Yeah. There's a no green growth whatsoever. They buy them and plant them and they don't come out. Usually they don't break dormancy until like end of May. You start seeing some shoots come up. And um, yeah, so I don't know where I was going with that except for... Go to the garden center. Go to the garden center. See what... <laughs> once a month, at least once a season, see what things are looking pretty and start adding stuff in. Um, and then you'll get to a point where, like, when I start tackling a flower bed, I kind of go, I have a little bit of a process. We do evergreen winter bone structure interest first. So any big trees, any evergreen winter interest because we want it to look good at its like at, at its worst. The worst time of the year for a garden to potentially look bad is in the winter time when you don't have flowers or green growth. So you want good bone structure in there. And then we go in with larger shrubs and things like that and then perennials and then annuals. And you can kind of start to think, well, I need to add some shrubs in. I'm kind of at that layer. Well, I want some shrubs that are gonna look good in the summer and fall, but I also want some shrubs that maybe will bloom like a forsythia in the spring for some bright spring color when my summer ones aren't looking as good. So you'll start thinking in terms, like in that those kind of terms, I think. Donna said, where did you purchase the black trellis? I'm guessing it was the trellis behind me in the beginning of the video. Or we showed the pink mink me cutting that back. Yeah, probably. That's yeah. the panacea. I think it's called the giant trellis from Gardener Supply. I installed those, maybe it's three years ago, maybe two years ago, I don't remember. When I installed those, I think they were around $90 a piece. I could be wrong, but I think, I, I remember thinking to myself, this is pretty inexpensive for how much beauty it's bringing to this space. Like you can buy a big, like expensive fountain to put up against this wall, or I can get three $90 trellises for a fraction. I mean, that's a fraction of the cost of a big wall fountain. Yeah. And it looks beautiful all year, you know, as opposed to a fountain, which you can't run in the winter time and that sort of thing. Anyway, yeah. uh, Bonnie said, I'm surprised you don't seem to have deer roaming your property at dawn or and dusk munching on your beautiful plants. Do you not have them? Or do you have some unique way of deterring them? We do not have them. One time one time we saw a deer yeah and we were shocked we were it was during a video i think we have you might have like a little bit of footage of oh, it. it was i was planting a window box yeah and we, you were like there's a deer in our yard yeah well i was shocked because it's it's crazy it is crazy like that deer was lost yeah very lost um, but no, we don't deal with deer. Um, our biggest pest nemesis in our area are gophers. Um, and I feel like that's pretty minor compared to deer. We have uh, little cottontail rabbits, but I don't really see them around our... But not a lot. Not and they a lot. don't really mess around No, we with have anything. foxes. Um, for a while there, I was seeing a fox go through every single night. Every night. And skunks. We have lots of skunks around here. They're so cute. The baby skunks are so cute. Yeah, following the parents. Oh, yeah, and there's like six of them yeah. behind the mama. Oh, so cute. Um, I am Alice said, what is your thought on fake grass? Would you ever use it? I used it under Benjamin's trellis. I bought some AstroTurf. It was pretty good looking, I thought. Yeah. Um, I think Linda Vodder, uh, she uses fake grass in her yard. And I think it looks good. Next video was moving the lemon cypress, treating the scale on our citrus and mulching in the wind. So several things in that video, I arranged and trimmed up the lemon cypress from the sun porch by our kitchen door. They'll probably end up back in here, I'm guessing, because I really like the way they look up here. And they did really well up here. Um, but like I said earlier, we have to get this room ready to be cleaned and painted. Um, moved the citrus out. I noticed that they had a problem. In the beginning of the video, I actually said, I need to deal with aphids on these citrus. And what I thought was aphids was a full-blown scale issue, like full-blown, bad. And I ended up finding it on the pink lemonade lemon while I was inspecting them once they moved to the barn. Didn't find any on the lime tree, but I'm, I'm treating all three of them. 
because I just don't want that issue to happen. And I want to take care of it on the two that it already happened to. And then uh, Aaron and I did some mulching out in the cut flower garden, which the biggest dust devil I think I have ever seen came through. Yeah. But I think that that was a really good rep representation of how I feel like the spring is gone for us. Like it's been the windiest spring I can ever remember here. It's been really trying because I can take most any kind of weather, but wind is not one of them. Wind like sets my teeth on edge. I don't know what it is. I think it's just the destruction and the, the dirt that, I mean, we live in an agricultural community and while I know our little front area is contributing hugely to the dust in this area, which it won't forever, we're working on it as fast as we can to get the grass in and all of that. But um, even so, I mean, we have farm fields just surrounding our town and it's just a, a dusty, dirty area. And it, when it's windy, it's worse. <laughs> so anyway, top comment was from Barbara. Flower cutting debris on the floor, isn't that horrible? No, Laura, that's real life of a working mother of two. Thank you, Barbara, for the validation. <laughs> sometimes things like that, like most of the time, we're pretty good about cleaning up after ourselves, but sometimes there's just other more important things and those, the mess will wait. Like it'll keep, yep. it'll be there waiting for you when you come back. Uh, P.S. said, what else can be used against scales eco-friendly? Well, I think I did one of the most eco-friendly things you can do by just squishing what you can find. Like squish that scale, kill as many of them as you can find. And then horticultural oil, it's mineral oil is the active ingredient. That's about as eco-friendly as you can get. I mean, you could use neem, you could use um, like the bio neem, you could use the tomato and vegetable spray, which is a pyrethrin and sulfur base that has scale on the label. Um, and those are pretty benign as well. Yeah. I think any three of those, but if you want to be 100% eco-friendly, you can just like squish them with your fingers. You can wear gloves if you want. <laughs> I don't rock, I don't roll the gloves, not even with bug squishing. Julie said, quick question, what kind of shoes does Aaron wear? They look like they, like what I need for working out on our property, protective but comfortable. Okay, first of all, I'm a city kid and these are, <laughs> these are Wolverines. I don't know anything about them. They're pretty comfortable. Where'd you buy them? I don't even remember. Like maybe Famous Footwear. They're just, I don't know. They just were like boots. I should get some boots. And then I started wearing some boots. It's so dusty that if I wear tennis shoes, the dust just gets right in the tennis shoes. You should so. try wearing some Vans sometime, Aaron. Oh, you should man. see my feet at the end of a day. Remember that one video that we showed you, uh, like pouring out the dust from your Vans? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like that every single day. Um, Daniel said, are you going to put the citrus trees in the Hartley? I heard you mention that it was going to have a heater. You know what? They may end up there. They might end up right back in the sun porch though, because I think that the reason why they do so well up here is that it's shaded enough in the summer that it keeps it fairly decent in there. It doesn't get like sweltering, but in the winter, I think that they actually benefit from getting cooler. Um, I think having them like inside our house where we've got forced air and it's hot, like not hot, but warm all the time. I feel like they shock more in there that it's drier inside than it is outside. And so I don't know. I feel like I found kind of a sweet spot with this front sun porch, but I might try, I might get some fresh ones for the Hartley have like my, my old ones up here in the sun porch and some fresh, I did get an olive tree, um, which, you'll see in a video this week. I got an olive tree. Anyway, I think that'll go in the Hartley. Judy said, when you say after the big winds, uh, you tell Aaron, and this is why I want to move, but every state in the U.S. has weather issues. True. Would you really consider moving after so much work you've put into your home and garden? Yes, <laughs> I would consider it. Um, and where would you move to? I can't see myself outside of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. I do understand, though, that every area has its issues. Like, if you want to go somewhere that's incredibly green and lush, well, you're going to deal with a ton more rain. And snow, probably. Well, maybe no, not. No, like Pacific Northwest. If you're yeah. dealing with, like, um, Western Oregon and Western Washington, where it's just, like, gorgeous. But they deal with a lot of overcast, rainy days in order to get that. And so, like, I don't know if I would do really well with that. Right. Because I'm so used to dry, like, dry, hot climate. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm very, I am very used to this, but uh, Aaron was showing me, or you were talking about a property in New Hampshire you were looking at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a little far for me, but yeah. um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Definitely I, out of Oregon, probably. There's a lot of things about Idaho that are enticing. Um, property you know, prices aren't one of them. No. Pro no. Whoa. Um, but it could have been. I mean, like not that long ago, property prices were pretty good. Mm-hmm. 
So we kind of missed out on that. But, you know, like some taxes are lower. Um, mm -hmm. Property taxes are lower. Although we do okay being county mm -hmm. as opposed to being in the city. Right. Um, but, you know, there's things like that where you're just looking at like, well, you know, what does it cost? Yeah, cost uh, of living. To living live here or there. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, we've talked about before some of the restrictions. Like, I just found out in order to have a, um, a landscape license like an in irrigation. Oregon, an irrigation license, yeah, you have to have gone to uh, have a horticulture education, um, a degree, so at least two years, okay. or have worked under someone for two years. A licensed, that, a licensed person. Yeah, horticulturist for two years and have them sign off. So... What that means is that there aren't a lot of, in a small community like ours, there just aren't a lot of people who have done that work. Like, mm -hmm. they're handy, you know. They they could totally do the work. Mm -hmm. They know how. But they're not licensed to do it, and so they won't come do the work for you. And they'll work in Idaho, mm -hmm. which is five minutes away. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. when, when there's a handful of people that you want to call to have, you know, do some quick work it for you. It means you pay a lot for it. Yeah, it just mm -hmm. means that you end up paying, paying a lot more. So mm -hmm. there's little things like that, too, where if we were just right across the border... Some things would be easier, but some things would be not as nice either. There's some nice things about Oregon too, like no sales tax. Yeah. Um, so you know, there's there's pros and cons there everywhere are. you go. You just have to decide what pros and cons, like what how many pros there are, and maybe in another state there'd be more pros than cons. I don't know. I mean, a huge one for us is all of our family. All of our immediate family lives right here in the valley, whether it's Oregon or yeah. Idaho. All yeah. of our siblings, in Within fact, an my hour. sister and her husband, they're moving from Washington. As we speak, they just signed on a lease on a new house in Meridian, um, Idaho. They're moving back from Yakima, Washington uh, in the next couple of weeks. So all of our siblings, all of our parents, we're all right here. Um, so I, I would have a hard time leaving the Treasure Valley, whether we're in Oregon or Idaho. Um, but oh, I, I wouldn't miss some of the weather stuff. I do like having four seasons. We do have that. Yeah. It's gotten chillier. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, should have got coffee instead of something cold. <laughs> okay. And the last video from this week was, I just scrolled away from it. Update on front yard destruction, transplanting a few things and driveway weed control. So I happened to be out here um, to grab the tree peony and some hardy geraniums right when uh, they were excavating the front sidewalk. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to show you like what... <laughs> what we're doing right now and what it's looking like. It's looking like kind of chaos. Kind of bad. Oh man. Yeah. It's looking bad up here and it's got to, it's got to look bad before it's going to come back together into something that we really want it to. And Aaron and I talked about it. Like we were just limping it by the water never worked very well up here. There were right. always dry spots. We were always um, dragging hoses around. Um, we had horrible like spurge issues up here in clover um, and like the grass was never nice up against the sidewalk up here. Well, and a lot of the plant choices are not something that you would do either. Not um, necessarily. There were just a lot of well, older... not in the arrangement that they were. Yeah, it just wasn't my space. I mean, yeah. you know, we're coming on in on somebody else's space. Who had come in on somebody else's space before them? You know, um, so we were just kind of limping the design by, and just to get it how we really want it. Which I don't even know exactly what I really want up here yet. Which is kind of a little scary that it looks like it does right now, and I don't even really know what the end result's going to look like. Um, you have to tear it apart. I mean, that's just part of it. And in order to add more lawn, we decided to tear up the lawn that was currently here because of the issues we're dealing with. And we were putting in, we need to put in new sprinklers. And we thought, well, let's just get rid of the grass, put in new sprinklers um, that are tailored exactly to our space and then put brand new grass in the whole thing. And that way it doesn't look like a patchwork kind of quilt yeah. going on. Anyway, and then I transplanted those plants and then we talked about some driveway and lawn weed control in that video. Top comment was from Marianne. I am a more than one project at a time gal myself. Love the mess, love the chaos. Oh, okay, we're different than that. I don't like the mess and I don't like the chaos, but it seems to like follow me around no matter what I'm doing. I always have a mess around me somewhere. Love the vision, I'm so, so happy for you. Thank you, Marianne. It is gonna be fun. And honestly, like always, always when we look back, I think, you know what, that was really cool. It was really cool that we actually were brave enough to do it like um the west side garden we were walking around last night with the kids aaron and i and we were looking at both sides of the driveway and i told him aaron like this is from us like this landscaping that we're looking at this is from us tearing out what was there and putting in what we wanted and we love it um so if we can just like you know work on a section or two at a time and get our space 
to that, then we'll enjoy every part of our garden instead of just limping by parts of it. And I know we all tend to have those those spots. I even did in our last garden, there'd be like um, a little spot where I'm like, oh, just really not that happy with that space. And instead of like going to the effort of tearing it up, I would just leave it for a while. And um, when I finally did it, I'm like, oh, why didn't I do that sooner? Anyway, Amanda said, when is the best time to move daffodils and tulips? The bloom is done. You'll want to wait until their leaves start to yellow and, and dry up, like start to drop, um, because it typically takes like oh, anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, but what those those leaves are doing is they are absorbing sunshine and it's going down into the, it's photosynthesizing, creating energy, feeding that bulb, which will then be able to form a nice bloom for the next year. You need to re-energize that bulb. So if you can possibly wait until the leaves have done their job and have started to yellow and dry up at that point, you can dig them up and move them. That's the best route. Um, Liz said maybe it was originally a wall. So we have this concrete barrier. I showed you in the video. It's massive. We could only see a little bit of it up above the flower bed. It was like a border around the front flower garden. And um, when we started to dig it out, we realized like this thing goes down. I don't know how, was that 18 inches or so? Like that concrete barrier, maybe a little more yeah, than that? Yeah, maybe more than that. So it was the concrete barrier, and then there was two pieces of rebar that ran through the whole thing. But the weird part, like I had tons of suggestions from you guys, like maybe it was a wall at one point, maybe it was a gate, maybe it was like a hitching post or something, like maybe they somehow like had whatever, or maybe it was gopher control. But if it was gopher control, it was only in like some spots, it's not everywhere. But there are no indications or indicators that there was anything ever attached to it, like in terms of being a wall or like there's nothing it's just concrete just like solid concrete you know I, maybe concrete was cheaper and so they just were like yeah this looks good we'll just make we'll a little barrier right here dig a massive trench and and put rebar in it too yeah, yeah for good measure yeah ah missus said is that a vine growing out of the window <laughs> the one down here <laughs> yes it is so we have Euonymus growing on the ground right below that window and somehow a piece of it, it's like growing up underneath the siding and it keeps on growing out. I thought I got it clipped out last year. Like you probably I, did. I roged out the whole thing like from underneath. Like oh. I searched along the base and I thought I got it, but it is alive and well because like, it's growing out. Like no need for a window box. We'll just have a nice shrub coming out of the wall <laughs> right here. No big deal. <laughs> uh, Patty said, oh, that whole thing will go. Like that whole thing will come out at some point. We're just not there yet. Uh, Patty said, great info about the weed spray. I'm going to try it. When is the gazebo going away? Well, at this, po <laughs> at this point, your guess is as good as mine. It was supposed to be gone in February. Um, and then we were told the first or second weekend in April, week of April. And then we gave after, them... After that went away, I called and yeah. said, we need, we need it gone by the last week of April because um, we've got people lined up. Well, that, and they said that was fine. And then I got a call saying, well, we can't do that. We can do the first week in May. And at that point, and I feel bad about this because like we're, you know, we want to donate it, but I told them if, you know, we can't keep stringing it out forever. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I, we are just going to have to disassemble it and just like donate the wood to yeah. whoever wants whoever to come wants and to come get, get it, it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, but we're going to have to disassemble it and move it out of its current location because we can't we have stuff lined up, you know, mm -hmm. like we've got contractors that are kind of going to come in and do work. Right. And we can't just push them off forever. Yeah. You know, so. And we know that like either way, whether we took it apart and like the supplies would go to somebody who would be able to use them for mm -hmm. sure. But it would be really nice to see it still intact somewhere because it is a pretty structure. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be as pretty as the Hartley, but it's a pretty structure. And um, I still want to see it live on yeah. somewhere if possible. So anyway. First week of May, we will see what happens. Uh, Kim said, love this, but Laura, do you miss not having a carport or in your case, a truck port to park under? Not really. You know, uh, both of our vehicles have the automatic start. And so, you know. As long as you can start them a few long, minutes yeah. before you go outside. If it's outside. cold and you can, yeah, you can mm -hmm. warm them up a little bit. It's not too bad. Yeah, no, I don't miss that really at all. Maybe in the beginning, because we didn't have cars that did that. Right. We didn't have a pickup when we moved into this yeah. house. We yeah, had two we had little two cars. cars. We had a '98 Honda. Nissan Sentra, which yeah. had the best AC of any car I've ever driven right. or owned ever. I paid eighteen hundred dollars for that car. That was an awesome car. And then we had a oh, what year was that Honda Civic? Uh, two thousand seven. Yeah, you bought that right after we got married. Yeah, or... I bought it because I was commuting about forty-five 
minutes or more every uh-huh. day. And right. I wanted something that was economical. Yeah. Something small. Oh, those were the days. It's easier yeah. to park those cars. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Um, Sally said, so glad you'll be re- reusing the pavers. What will happen to the red brick when you redo that area? That we will find a home for. We won't use it anywhere here. The stuff at the brick patio. Yeah. It's right. like a mishmash of different things. That'll be given away. That'll be given away. Uh, Rayanne said, what the heck is behind Aaron at 1615? Now, I haven't gone up and looked at it close, but I think it's a stack of uh, fencing, like the really nice like Powder River kind of fencing on our neighbor's property. They do keep cows and pigs down below the hill, and so I think that they're just going to be bolstering up their fencing down there. That's what I'm guessing. They have it sitting on a uh, concrete pad that they had poured at one point because they were going to do it like a little gazebo in that spot, and they may still do that. I don't know. Um, anyway, I think that's what it is, though. That's what it looks like. They're green, yeah. I think. Anyway, Jermaine said, Russell is so funny. I appreciate you showing the killing of weeds in your gravel to us. Would this work with bindweed? So like I said earlier, I'm going to be trying it on bindweed. We will see what happens and how many applications it takes. Hopefully it it kills it because that would be awesome if we could find a good natural way to do that. Christy said, so exciting to see all the projects in progress. Question, what's going on with the waterfall that was put in last year? Will it be moved? Just curious. Um, And I just thought I would answer that one more time because I do still see that question come up quite a bit. We put in that uh, pondless waterfall, Greg Woodstock and um, his designer, Brian, they came here and they installed this beautiful water feature for us before we had dis- we even knew that a Hartley was even in the cards for us. And so that was like months before, like two or three months, yeah. maybe four months before we decided like pull the trigger on the Hartley. So we didn't know we were going to need to excavate that area. Anyway, Greg may even come back um, and help us install that somewhere else on our property. We've been talking to him about it. He knows. Um, And, you know, he knows that things evolve and whatever. But the cool thing about that is it's a kit and it's not super difficult to install. I say that because they were doing (laughs) most of the digging and such. But being able to be there and watch it go in, I feel like I would have a much better idea now. To them, you know, they look at it as just a single day job. Right. You know, It would take me like a, it would take me a while. I think they say for anybody else, it'd be like a a weekend weekend job. Mm -hmm. Um, but for them, they just, they bust it out in an afternoon, which is funny because they're just so, yeah, they're so quick at it. (sighs) Yeah. So to them moving it is like, oh, no big deal. Yeah. Like they shipped in all their supplies. They arrived to us on pallets and then they had an outfit bring, um, what's Chris's company's name out of Caldwell? Oh, uh, uh, green skate. Yeah. I'm not sure. We'll put it on the screen. Anyway, they um, brought over some rock and they actually did some of the labor too. They uh, brought a big bin full of rock and then, yeah. I don't think we actually started that project. Greg and I went to the garden center to get some plants that morning and they maybe started at 11 ish and we're done by like four 30. <laughs> <laughs> They're professionals. You can tell it's fun to watch people like that work though. Um, Let's see. Jake said, so I guess a garden tour is out of the question for the next month, huh? LOL. (laughs) I was actually just thinking it's such a beautiful time right now in other spots of our garden. We did do an April garden tour, so we'll probably do something somewhere in May at some point. Maybe we'll squeeze my parents' garden in there at some point. Yeah. I don't know that a lot has changed since the last time. Their garden is mature, so uh, I feel like we need to hit their garden at different seasons. But we have a lot of new followers. That's true. Yeah, that's true. We could like hundreds of thousands from the last time we did a tour. So probably worth it. Yeah. We're actually gonna head out there today because um, we're gonna plant some stuff in their flower beds. So anyway, so Nia said, will the peonies still bloom for you this year? I'm hoping so. There were three very strong buds on that plant. So I am crossing my fingers that the transplant didn't shock its system too much. It has not wilted or anything where I put it. Uh, it still looks just as good as it did in that flower bed. So I'm hoping that it takes and that we still see some blooms. If not, that's okay. At least the plant's there and it'll bloom in coming years. And that's it for today's recap video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, yeah, we've got a lot going on this week. I think we're going to organize to maybe get all those trees planted on the new property which means a big auger. We're gonna have to rent a big auger. Yeah, we should probably call today to get that scheduled. <laughs> yeah, I, we finally figured out where we wanted pathways and I'm really glad I didn't rush it because how I was going to- You changed it from I your did. original yeah. design. Yeah, how, uh, well, the, the front one here, kind of closest that leads to the cut flower garden is pretty much the same-ish. Um, but on the other side, I kind of changed it a little bit and I'm, I think I'm gonna really like it. 
I think it has the um, ability to look kind of secret garden-ish. I was actually even thinking too, like on one side of the driveway, it would be kind of cool to build it up a little bit. You know how they did in uh, Spring Meadow uh -huh. in their trial gardens? They've got Spring Meadows, the Proving Winners Color Choice trial gardens is just phenomenal in Michigan. And we were able to stay in the cottage in the middle of that garden and along the road there they have they have an intense berm that's built mm -hmm. up i think it's something like a lot smaller it'd be kind of cool to berm that up so that that's like almost a sunken like secret garden in that corner yeah we could do that easily. wouldn't that be really cool yeah anyway i can see a lot of weeds growing anyway that's it for the today's video thank you guys so much for watching i hope you're having a great day and we will see you in the next one bye